Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. At the beginning of Section 4 of David Hume's Inquiry Concerning Human Understanding, he introduces a distinction that will not only be very important in this work, but run throughout pretty much all of Hume's works as a general distinction, whether he's making use of it or not. So it's really important to understand it and, and get it down because it's sort of a key that helps you understand the reasoning taking place. For example, in his dialogues concerning natural religion or, or in other works as well. And it's a very simple distinction to wrap your head around once we go through it a little bit. It's a distinction that he brings up at the start by saying, all the objects of human reason or inquiry may naturally be divided into two kinds, namely relations of ideas and matters of fact. Now, objects of human reason or inquiry, anything that we could be interested in, anything that we could be curious about, anything that we could take a position on. So don't let the reference to reason throw you off. The inquiry part is in some respect more important. When we're deciding what we're going to order from a menu at a restaurant, we are engaged in a kind of inquiry. What, what am I hungry for? You know, is this worth the money that I'm going to pay for this? This one says, you know, uh, the, instead of a price, it says the market price. I wonder what that could be, you know, for the lobster that I'm going to pick or something along those lines. That is inquiry. Uh, thinking about, uh, should I date this person or not date this person? Should I ask them out or shouldn't I ask them? That is and inquiry. All sorts of things fall on, within the scope of inquiry. So, you know, it could also be like, I get out of bed and I don't feel good. What's going on? Am I sick? Did I not get enough sleep? Did I drink too much the night before? Is it uh, some environmental factor? That is an inquiry as well. So anything that we would engage in reasoning about in a very explicit way or anything that we're wondering about figures into this. And he tells us we can divide these up into these, these two classes. So let's look at relations of ideas first. What does he tell us? Geometry and mathematics. Now he speaks about algebra and arithmetic. You know, mathematics was not quite as advanced. Of course, they did have the integral calculus at that time. Uh, going beyond algebra, but Hume is not a, a particularly mathematically oriented thinker, and he, he thinks that you'll get the general idea. When you took mathematics classes, what was it that was so distinctive about math? You might say, well, there were right answers and wrong answers, and that was what was really great about it compared to, say, social studies or English. Science, of course, is supposed to yield us you know, the right answers and the wrong answers, but it works when we talk about the sciences and we're comparing them to mathematics, we're actually talking about, say, the natural sciences, which have some empirical aspects to them. As a matter of fact, they're, they're entirely uh, shot through with a, a kind of empirical data orientation, whereas geometry, mathematics... Not quite so much. And you might say, wait a second, I remember my geometry class and we had these protractors and we had to spin them around and make circles and, you know, bisect angles and all that sort of stuff. Yes, that's true. You were carrying out a crude approximation of what real geometry is, which is something purely of ideas. 
Geometry, you know, is carried out by ways of proofs, and you could do it as he says, even if no triangles and circles existed in the world, you could still do geometry. Same thing with mathematics. You know, the relations between numbers have a different sort of certainty and, uh, you know, you could say tractability to reasoning than experiential things do, even the things of the sciences. So they provide a prime example there. He could have added one other thing, logic. Logic, so long as it's deductive logic, and even if you think about this, maybe the structure of inductive logic on a, on a meta level, is certain, demonstrable. It's, it's what Hume is calling relations of ideas. And he tells us that within relations of ideas, every affirmation is either intuitively or demonstrably certain. Either we begin from it as an axiom, and we say that, well, we just know this to be the case. How do we know it to be the case? We just know it, and that's it. That's a starting point. Or we reason from those starting points or from other theorems that we've derived at some, some place along the line, you know, the, the apparatus of logic. We don't have to keep proving, you know, how, say, truth tables work to know that they work. They can be demonstrably certain. And he tells us that, a little bit later, these involve abstract reasoning a priori. Now, this a priori term is one that you're going to see quite a bit in Hume. By the time that he's you know, talking about these things, a priori has become part of the philosophical lexicon. And what does it mean? No experience is needed. As a matter of fact, you're actually better off without any experience to get in the way of carrying out these, these inferences by working with the relations of ideas. You could say, in a certain respect, that relations of ideas are things that are entirely in your head uh, without any engagement with the outside world. That's a little bit of a misleading way to think about it. You could e equally say they exist entirely on paper or whatever it happens to be, whatever model or metaphor you want to use, they have no actual connection with the world of our experience doesn't mean they can't be applied. You can apply geometry to you know, architecture. You can apply mathematics to you know, thinking about how chemical interactions ought to work. But you don't need any of that other messy empirical stuff. As, as a matter of fact, when you're carrying out these reasonings, you're better off without it. On the other side, we have matters of fact. What Hume is going to call our, you know, engagement with, with uh, moral philosophy, moral understood quite broadly, and moral propositions. Um, anything that has to do with the reality of things, anything that has to do with our experience of the world. And so it includes everything else. So to go back to our examples about um, should I ask this person out on a date, and then you might add the, the you know, subsequent uh, question, well, how should I ask them out on a date? What words should I use in order to try to achieve the effect that I want to do or create the opening for the other person to produce effects that I, I would like? If we want to use kind of rather human language, right? Not very romantic. But if we're doing that, we're actually inquiring about matters of fact. And this is, this is actually where a lot of people get things screwed up. They treat things like dating or cuisine or you know exercise as if they're merely about relations of ideas and they deductively opine about all sorts of stuff and they're usually full of it. They, they, they are quite unsuccessful because they don't actually connect it to experience or when they do, they connect it to too little experience that they generalize too much from. So anyway, everything else. And he says that the evidence of the truth of these other things may be very, very strong. For example, he uses the sun will rise tomorrow, right? None of you doubt that, but it's not 100%. The sun could go out. I mean, we have science fiction things where that happens, right? Um, There's actually a, a, a movie recently where the sun darkens. Didn't turn out to be a very good movie. <laughs> I actually had to quit it about two-thirds of the way through because nothing was happening. 
Um, but the fact that you can conceive of that means that it's not 100%. The evidence of the truth is less than relations of ideas because this is what we call a posteriori. It's not a priori. It's no longer purely deductive, although deductive reasoning may play a part in it. It is either inductive or abductive or whatever other model we want to use and contrast against that. And that's, that's a little bit of a side note that I don't want to get too bogged down in. Hume makes a couple really interesting and important points here, which again, he's going to use later on in other works. So the contrary of a matter of fact is conceivable. It's not something that couldn't possibly be the case, right? He says the contrary of every matter of fact is still possible because it can never imply a contradiction and is conceived by the mind with the same facility and distinctness as if ever so conformable to reality, that the sun will not rise tomorrow is no less intelligible a proposition and implies no more contradiction than the affirmation that it will rise, right? We can't imagine what it would be like for the sun not to rise. Now you say, well, what about people who have a really truncated imagination? You know, Hume isn't going to talk about those here, but that, that would be a problem, not for him, but for them. They would think all sorts of things are actually relations of ideas that are matters of fact. And this is a, a very interesting point. Hume thinks that because we can conceive of things being different than they are, we can never be 100% certain that they're going to turn out the way that we expect. And, you know, in, in large respect, that's quite right. Whether it's 100%, well, that's, that's an issue that we could talk about later on. And whether that and the workings of that falls into relations of ideas, that's another, another conversation for another time. But we will say this. This is quite interesting. So contradiction, right? You could say, well, wait a second. The sun not rising contradicts things that we know about the sun, namely that we're not seeing any reason why it should stop you know, rising or actually just emitting its light and, and the earth you know, spinning and stuff like that. And you say, well, okay, so you're saying that there's a contradiction there, but it's just a contradiction for another matter of fact, which could also be wrong, which could also be false. It's not contradicting any sort of relation of ideas. So the way in which contradiction is working here is, is quite important. He also says that these matters of fact involve reasoning from other things, you know, from uh, the basis of what it is that we sense or remember or imagine. We have to have some sort of contact either with the outside world or the interior world of our own perception and our body. Well, we can have all sorts of matters of fact about what Hume calls the passions. You know, I get angry when this happens. Um, you know, for example, one of the things that tends to gall me is when fabrics stick to each other in such a way as to kind of get in my way. I'm trying to tie my tie, and it's not tying right because it's stuck on the material of the shirt. Now, that's, you know, that's a bit about my own personal psychology, and that doesn't have to be the way it is. And one example of how I know that is other people don't get similarly upset. Right? So maybe there's something about my own characteristics and constitution that leads to that. But I don't even have to be that way myself. That is entirely on the side of matter of fact. Hume also tells us one really important thing about this side of matter of fact. He says that matters of fact... The truth of them, our belief in them, is founded, if not exclusively, but primarily, on the relation of cause and effect. He actually says all reasonings concerned matter of fact seem to be founded on the relation of cause and effect. By means of that relation alone, we can go beyond the evidence of our memory and senses. If you were to ask a man why he believes any matter of fact which is absent, for instance, that his friend is in the country or in France, he would give you a reason, and this reason would be from some other fact, as a letter received from him, or the knowledge of his former resolutions and promises. So when we're 
claiming things about other matters of fact that go beyond our direct experience, it's usually from some sort of inference based on cause and effect, could also involve contiguity, resemblance, yes, uh, but it's going to be based on some connection to other matters of fact, it, oftentimes quite a few other matters of fact. So this is the fundamental distinction that he's making, and he's going to do an awful lot with this.